really good presenter now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll maybe go ahead and get started. Yes, that sounds good. All right. Uh, so, oops. Um, Adin, Buju, everyone, Chi Miigwech, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's panel as we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. My name is Emily Shaw. I'm a PhD candidate in environmental engineering at Michigan Tech, and I'll be the event moderator with my co-host Val Ganyu with the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Tech. We want to begin this evening in a good way by acknowledging that many of us are attending this webinar from the ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Anishinaabe. That I'm co-hosting from my office on the shores of Portage Lake feels appropriate as we gather together, gather together to celebrate Nibi or water. These waters sustain body and soul, creating homes for many gagoon, fish, and connecting us with Gichigami, Lake Superior. Before we begin our panel, I just wanna make a couple of quick notes. Uh, first, we are recording this panel or this webinar. We'll put captions on it and then share that out with all of you when that's ready. Um, second, in this webinar format, only the moderators and panelists have the microphone. So please, as we're going, type questions as they come to you and we'll incorporate them into the panel as we go. And third, this event is funded and made possible by a diversity in action grant from Michigan Tech. As a part of our grant responsibilities, we'll be sharing out a brief survey after the panel. Uh, please take a few minutes, fill that out and help us meet those grant requirements. Thanks, Emily. So I'm really excited to get started and I want to briefly introduce our guests today who are going to share with us their stories and experiences that are related to water, social justice, and celebrating land and life in our region. And so we have five panelists. Jessica Koski is Ojibwa from the Keweenaw Bay Indian community and an alumna of Michigan Technological University in 08. She has a master's degree in environmental management focused on social ecology and environmental policy from the Yale School of the Environment. She currently lives in Minneapolis and that's where she serves as a branch chief and program manager and regional fish and wildlife bio biologist for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Midwest region and she supports the restoration and conservation of tribal natural trust resources. Kathleen Smith, feel free to turn on your, your video when I introduce you. Jessica, can you say hi to everyone with your video? Hi, <laughs> hi everybody. So good to see you. And everyone will turn them on um, during the, the panel if your internet connection is all right. So Kathy, Kathy Smith, she's an enroll, enrolled member of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and she currently serves as the habitat specialist for the KBIC Natural Resources Department. As an Anishinaabe Quay, she advocates for Nabi, for water, as a water protector, and she does this as Nabi has cultural significance for the indigenous people across this region. Welcome, Kathy. I mean, Cecilia Lapointe is the founder and owner of Red Circle Consulting, Wab Ajijak Press, and the Native Justice Coalition. They come from the Keweenaw Bay Indian community and Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe and currently live in the land beneath the trees, also known as Manistee, Michigan. They identify as two spirit based in their Ojibwe culture from an old school and decolonial framework. Welcome Cecilia. Would you? And we have Dr. Martin Reinhardt. He is an Ojibwe, Anishinaabe Ojibwe citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie 
tribe of Chippewa Indians in Michigan. He is a tenured professor and chair of Native American Studies at Northern Michigan University, president of the Michigan Indian Education Council, and the lead singer and songwriter for the band, Huawei Yeye. Ye I can job. do better. I can do better. You did great. Well, Bonjour, everybody. Good to be here. And his current research focuses on revitalizing relationships between humans and indigenous plants and animals of the Great Lakes region. You may also know him as the primary investigator for the Decolon Decolonizing Diet Project. Welcome. And we have Dr. Margaret Newton a professor of English and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she also serves as the Associate Dean of the Humanities and Director of the Electa Quinney Institute for American Indian Education. She is the author of Bawajimo, a dialect of dreams in Anishinaabe language and literature, Weiweine, and What the Chickadee Knows which are both bilingual collections of poetry in Anishinaabe Moan and English. And if you want to learn more about our work, visit Ojibwe.net, a wonderful, wonderful resource. Welcome, Meg. Boujou, it's good to see everybody. And welcome to all of our attendees as well. Thank you. Um, now we'd like to take just five minutes for um, I'm sorry, we'd like to invite each panelist to take five minutes to introduce themselves and speak to the ways your work and daily lives center on and or promote social justice, water protection, and celebrating indigenous lands, water, and lives. So we'll go ahead and start with Jessica. All right, I um, mean, um, so I just introduced myself in my uh, Anishinaabe Moan, Ojibwe language. Um, my spirit names are Leading Woman and Springtime Woman. I am from the Otter Clan and I'm from the Kiwana Bay Indian community. Um, as Emily mentioned, or Val mentioned, um, I currently live um, in the Minneapolis area, which is the Dakota Sioux homelands. Um, so my life and work with um, working with Native people and also the environment began about 15 years ago when I started out um, at the Kiwana Bay Ojibwe Community College. Um, so I returned to the reservation to um, attend college and I was reconnected with uh, my community and that was the journey started for revitalizing um, our history, the history that I didn't learn grow growing up in our public school systems where I went to school, mostly in Northern Wisconsin. Um, and then that also inspired revitalization throughout my family as well. Um, and so that's, you know, certainly my foundation. And from there, um, just as I was about to begin, um, attending Michigan Tech, I had an opportunity that was supported through the White House Initiative on Tribal Colleges and Universities at the time, where I was able to intern, do a research internship um, in NASA in Greenbelt, Maryland with uh, my mentor at the time was Nancy Maynard. And she, or her work involved um, bringing together indigenous knowledge and Western science data to solve problems, including climate change and other environmental issues. Um, so at that time, I was able to really dive into an issue that was really um, at the forefront to my community. Um, and that was um, a lot of risks or a lot of concerns about the risk of acid mine drainage um, and mining impacts um, to Lake Superior. And so since then that really, um, got everything in motion to my path since then, um, you know, working my education and then also working, um, you know, experience with grassroots organizing, um, working for my tribal government to educate 
my community and the wider community, um, helping to um, review technical documents related to mining and assess what the impacts would be um, to try to influence the permitting processes um, to also international advocacy, um, partnering with the Bad River Band um, and um, preparing a statement of the impact of mining activities to the United Nations, um, to also serving on a board for an uh, international NGO for uh, mining and speaking abroad at multinational corporate shareholder meetings. Um, and also working on national policy through the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, when they previously had an Indigenous Peoples Working Group. Um, so currently I'm working within the federal government. Um, so my current role has really, you know, I feel really fortunate for all the experiences that I've had. And so currently I work um, to support and enhance many different natural resource programs for tribes throughout the Midwest region but also in the Eastern region for the Great Lakes. Um, and the biggest program that um, I'm currently involved in is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, so I, I work with um, really closely with the Environmental Protection Agency, Great Lakes National Program Office and about 14 other federal agencies um, to foster positive relationships, um, federal tribal relationships to protect and restore um, our Great Lakes, which are the largest um, freshwater system in the world. Um, and <clears throat> so I know I'm kind of jumping ahead um, or running out of time here, um, but I guess just to wrap up, you know, as an Anishinaabe Kwe, um, you know, it's also not only in the work that I do, um, but also just in the life that I live and um, um, I think I set my timer, so I think I'm up. Uh, I think Whoa. that's my yeah. introducing. Thank you so much, Jessica. You did not have to set a timer for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead next, we'll go to Cecilia and then Kathy and then Drs. Reinhardt and Newton. All right. Boju Nigegan Spapi Indishnakaz Aji Jakturam, Trikudam Minawa Mashki ZB Indojba, Namanikan and Dao. I said my name is Little Laughing Otter. I'm Crane Clan. I come from the Kibunabe Indian community and the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, and I live in the land beneath the trees, otherwise known as Manistee, Michigan. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start with a little bit of background of how I got to do the work that I'm doing today. And I just want to give a shout out to the place I came from because without that community, without that village, it, it, I wouldn't be the person I am today. So I'm really grateful I was raised in a progressive union blue collar home in the inner ring suburb of Detroit. Um, I was raised in a community and a village where, you know, at the time we cared about community and we cared about each other. We had things like black parties and sat on each other's porches. That doesn't really happen that much today with the disconnection. Um, so with that being said, just, I do not like the word activism because it has the word act in it. And with act, it's about temporarily acting. So I believe in community work. That is what has been instilled in me starting at about age 12. At age 12, I literally held my mother's hand and we fought against gentrification in my hometown. Um, so that's when I learned to, you know, take action and speak out. That was the first time I ever spoke out at a city commission meeting. And I learned that our voices really didn't matter when they were gentrifying our hometown. As I move forward through my journey, um, I've been involved in a variety of things. Most recently, um, my passion is solidly racial justice work in Anishinaabe Aki. So how I got there is not through an easy journey, but to understand that and the work and the labor that goes into building a coalition, goes into building businesses, as well as a small press. It, it literally is the blood, sweat, and tears. So with that being said, I wanna talk about um, 
you know, getting to where we're at today, which has a lot of beauty. And that's what we want to do in this work is bring that beauty back into the community. Because within what we've endured as Native people and still what we endure today, you know, we don't see a lot of beauty. So I'm all about the beauty, which beauty can equal healing, it can equal racial justice, and it can equal stories. So um, with that being said, I had initially started Red Circle Consulting. Of course, it was a a lot of the consulting opportunities I had were part-time. I worked with organizations like the Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion, Honor the Earth, and I presented universities and different things like that. Um, we had one of our events in Kiwana Bay in 2015 as I was working with the Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion. After this event was over, we wondered what could we do? Um, and so this event was Healing Stories on Racial Equity. It was a beautiful event, and it was the only event in this occurring at the state in the state at the time as a part of a statewide racial equity coalition. So these other events took place in Detroit, Flint, and Benton Harbor, and we were the only Native community in Michigan at the time. So we had um, 16 story shares and 16 event attendees. And with that being said, the event flew by and it was amazing and beautiful. And that's how the Native Justice Coalition was born um, right there in Keweenaw Bay. So in that, in that time, the Native Justice Coalition has remained a project under my consulting business. We've, we're waiting for the 501c3 determination as we speak. We're en route to it. And it's a very exciting thing. But um, I just wanted to see how it would go. And so it's really grown. Um, the primary focus of the work is racial justice. We have the Anishinaabe Racial Justice Conference annually, which we had to cancel this year because of the pandemic. Um, we also have our Anishinaabe Healing Stories on Racial Justice, and we have a Two-Spirit program, MMIWG2S program, and a harm reduction project. And we're going to be looking at some other things to birth in 2021. So it's been a very exciting journey, but it also is, this work is so critical because it is about, you know, a lot of the time the racial justice work is intricately connected to treaty rights, to environmental justice, to, to the water. So very, very important. Um, and with that being said, the next thing I'd like to share about is Wab Ajijak Press. So as a poet and a writer, um, I've always been very passionate about poetry. So how a lot of our stories and the first few stories that were written through Wab Ajijak Press were kind of written in a poem form. Um, the one Ajijak Crane, and Bijou, and the new story that we have that um, that just is just came out this week. So I mean, last week, excuse me, but um, it feels like this week because <laughs> we've gotten so many orders, which is exciting. Um, but just the passion for you know to bring that beauty, to bring that love into the community for this work, and it's very exciting. Um, and also speaking about the connections of um, you know, the personal, the, the ways we also show up outside of the work. Um, one of the things I think that I'd like to share and I'm very excited about it is, of course, running. I've been a lifelong runner since I've been 15 years old. And when I grew up in the big city um, in metropolitan Detroit, one of the ways I connected to the land and the water was through running. And I grew up right in the middle of the metropolitan region. I grew up by an eight lane road. Many of you may know this, Woodward Avenue and I-75 and 696. So living in the land beneath the trees is wonderful compared to uh, being around the smog and the cars. But as growing up there, um, one way I did connect was through running, which I believe another way we defend the land is through running. So I'll end with that and Jimmy Gretsch. Thank you, Gretsch. I can't wait to see the new book. Kathy? Mbuju Nanoi Mangandug, Wasa no de Kwe Nijinikaz, Mayingin Indon Deyam, Nishinabe Mende Kwe Indao, Wekwe Dung Indunjaba, 
So my name is um, Wasa No Dekwe. It's um, Northern Lights Woman. I am from the Wolf Clan. And also, you know, my home here is Wekwe Dung, which is the Kuna Bay Indian community. So my journey to how I got to this point, it's a long story, but um, I'll give you the shortened version of it. Um, I moved away from this space here in 1980. My dad was a Michigan Tech um, graduate in forestry. He actually worked for Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so we traveled many spaces, you know, out west. Um, where I kind of settled, you know, for a number of years was um, California. So I got to experience many cultures in the Pacific Northwest, up in Alaska, the Chippewa Cree over in Montana, and, you know, a lot of Native communities over in California. And so what my job there was, I was actually a wildland firefighter for the federal government. I worked for the Bureau of Land Management, which I worked my way up to be a fire engine captain. And so I did that job for about 17 years in the California Desert District, the Mojave Desert of all places. So, you know, having this, this fire background, you know, I started kind of waking up and was like, man, there's got to be something more to life than chasing fire across this desert floor. And so I saw these, um, these posts, you know, once I joined Facebook about, you know, this way that um, this grandmother that started these, this water walk movement. And, um, and I could only wish that I was a part of that, you know, so when that journey started coming, that spirit started speaking within me, you know, I, my aunt actually called me up from out here. Um, her name is Cecilia Dowd, and she actually said, hey, I'm going over to Bad River. I'm going to go to Lodge. Medewin Lodge, she said, you should meet me over there. And I was like, okay. So I came, you know, I kind of reconnected then. That was probably about seven years ago to where I started making my journey back to Lodge, back home to where I'm sharing the space right now. But I had one gentleman when I was out in California, you know, I was kind of coming amongst some troubled times, you know, and you know, when you have that one foot in the, the real world, you know, and then you have another foot in this world, you just kind of is drawn always back home. Um, so I had to make a decision what I was going to do with that spirit. Um, but, you know, when I went to him for some advice and I said, man, I'm just having these problems and these issues and, you know, I just need some help. He goes, well, what you need to do is to go home and learn your own medicines. So that's what kind of compelled me to, to actually start coming to Lodge. I've been going for probably over seven years. I initiated into Lodge and then I started coming home to Cuna Bay Indian Community to where you know, my, my ancestors have been. And then retying back into you know, Mother Nature and such a beautiful place here and with the water, you know, I started um, learning about my own medicines. I started going out and learning the plants again. And, you know, just actually I'm reminding myself, you know, the things that I have forgot because we never forget these things, you know, and these, these healing medicines that we do have all around us, you know, it's just reconnected me back to mother earth in a good way, instead of chasing that fire across, you know, the desert floor or throughout the Western United States and that previous work. But now, you know, I, I started coming home and I actually um, applied for a plant technician for the Cuna Bay Indian Community Natural Resources Department as I was, you know, still going to learn my teachings over at Three Fires Medaven Lodge. Um, so I would travel back and forth, you know, between California and here, but it felt like I was just not at rest yet. I still felt like I was just riding this fence post you know I'm just always on the fence I was either going one way or the other and so I had to come to this fork in a road to make this decision to come back home and to learn more about my culture and tie back in you know with Medaven Lodge where you know Eddie Benton he was um, our grand chief at the time and he would always you know speak about me because I got to be known as California Kathy because I would at four times all the year I was here you know, I wanted, I was so thirsty for this knowledge and my own culture and to hear the little boy, you know, with the drum. Um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful connection that I had made, you know, back with my Medewin family and the people that are here. 
oh my goodness, you know, so then I started bringing the teachings back here to my own community because that's where it's needed. Um, so then my work kind of fell into to um, the natural resources department where now I'm the habitat specialist and it reconnected me back to the water. Um, now I kind of fell into the job of stepping into somebody else's shoes, Pauline Knapp Spruce, who started the water walk movement along with, you know, she brought the teachings over here also from grandmother Josephine and Eddie Benton from his grandmothers. And so I have many way out there that are here, you know, within our audience that are here to support me and to, you know, give me that, that love and, you know, acknowledgement that I need to, to continue this work. Because when you fill somebody else's shoes, you know, oh my gosh, it's a big job to do. So within my own community, what I do is, um, Jessica had mentioned the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So I also do restoration as a habitat specialist, not only with native plants, but also with wild rice. So we do a lot of wild rice restoration. We do invasive species removal. I work with um, college interns. We work with uh, KBIC youth, which is really near and dear to my heart because I'm hoping to do more work with them when we are come back to um, the space to where we can actually bring them back, you know, and continue this work with them. Because I really feel important that, you know, this knowledge needs to be passed on to our youth. And to do this work, you know, we need them to be standing by our side. So with the water walk here with um, the Kuna Bay Indian community, you know, the, our annual water walk, we had had our seventh year along with some of my sisters, Lisa Denemy, Terry Denemy, and Jessica was actually a part of the planning process when it first started bring, bringing it back to our community. So, you know, Pauline Spruce had since walked on, you know, she used to call me up, hey, Nige, you gotta come do the water walk? And I was like, ah, it's, it's too early because I was on California schedule at the time, but I would get up and I would come and, you know, join in on the water walk to where now I walk side by side, you know, with our community to bring awareness to the water. It started out with, you know, a core group of seven. And then since we had opened it all for all religions, all people, because, you know, we're sitting in a unique community where we have Lance Village and Berga Village to where the Cuna Bay Indian community is enveloped around them. You know, for all of us to get to this point, you know, we did apply, you know, as a tribe many years back, which Jessica is aware of for the treatment as a state for the air and water. And we're the first tribe in the state of Michigan to hold that status. And what work, you know, that we couldn't do that work without the Jagannath, without the others. So we walk hand in hand with, you know, our partners that we have, and we have numerous partners, you know, that help us with our grants and with our work that we do here. And without them, we wouldn't be at this point right now. So, you know, everybody wants to feel connected. Everybody wants to return back to the earth. And it's so important right now, you know, with that beautiful life, that beautiful need be that it surrounds us. It's just a unique community. So with the water walk movement, we went from the Kuna Bay Indian community, the local water walk, to now we do the, the people of the heart water walk. So Terry Denemy, she had, you know, we usually chit chat and, you know, she's my Medewan sister also, but um, she had this vision of connecting all communities, you know, so we started people of the heart water walk last year, which we went from Copper Harbor Lighthouse up in Copper Harbor all the way to Sandpoint Lighthouse right here in Cuna Bay. It's a three day water walk and we open it all, open it to everyone, you know, no matter what culture, what background that you have, because with our, um, our grand chief, he says, no matter what creation story that you have, he goes, it's all true. And so that's how I promote, you know, our water walk because, you know, we are all connected by one thing, which is Nibi, which is the water. You know, so I have many partners here, many people that I have known that are water walkers here on this panel and also in the in the audience that are now observing, you know, our panel. And, you know, miigwech to all of you for, for attending and supporting us, you know, about this good talk about the water, you know, because, oh my gosh, without it, we wouldn't be here right now. And that's what really connects all of us, you know, so it's a lot of work to be able to stand side by side, you know, and to actually do this work together. And that's what it's all about. 
so bewitched to for having me. It's such an honor to sit here before you and to speak about the water and to speak about these things and how important it is that we must stand together and advocate for good, clean water. So that's all I have for now. Meet you. Miigwech, Kathy. So Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Newton, go ahead. You said uh, Reinhardt and Newton, so uh, go ahead, Meg, if you'd like to go first, please. It's okay. We can go in the order she said either way. Go ahead. Okay. Dean Tom. My name is Marty Reinhardt, and it's now Bamwin. Uh, that uh, hawk coming down out of the eastern sky. And uh, my family, we're from Bawating, uh, place of the rapids. Uh, a lot of people know that as Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, or Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. I spent a great deal of time on Cary Street, right on the canal in Sault Ste. Marie as a kid, and on Zispakwat Minas, uh, Sugar Island. And Sugar Island was a, uh, a magical place a place where we uh, lived on the shores of uh, the Baraga Bay, uh, making bridges out to this little round island. We just called it Round Island. It was just this little itty bitty island out in the bay. And, uh, you know, that was where we spent our summers with my grandma and my cousins, and it was life. Uh, we also went out spearfishing, you know, and that uh, at spearfishing, I remember the first time I got to go out with my uncles, I was just a little guy, and it was before we had our our treaty rights uh, reaffirmed. And, you know, the Coast Guard, they would always mess with us. And uh, we were out spearfishing one night and and my uncle said, uh, oh, throw all the stuff in the water. Let's get away from here. He said, uh, Jim and Marty, you guys remember where we're at? You guys are gonna go get our equipment back when we when they leave. And it was, it was dark. And so that was our job, you know, as the little guys, we were gonna jump in and swim down and get the equipment back up. And that it was, I'll tell you what, you know, like uh, if you guys have seen that Harry Potter where they have the seaweed one where they're swimming down on the seaweed and the mermaids, that's what I was thinking, man. There's gonna be all kinds of stuff down there gonna grab me and pull me under. And anyway, but it wasn't like that. We, uh, it was cold and it was dark, but we got our stuff and we got it back. You know, uh, the work I do is as a professor of Native American studies, I teach people about a lot of the things that uh, folks have already spoken about this evening already. And uh, it's for, for me, it's like therapy because I get to think about it all day long, all these things. And I get to, it's really a, a luxury. You know, it's a, a privilege that not a lot of people have, you know, uh, to be able to spend this much time thinking about these things. Uh, so I really appreciate the gifts I've been giving. I've been very blessed. I'm a father of two Anishinaabe Ojibwe Kwe. You know, my uh, daughters both uh, graduated from Northern Michigan as well. Uh, my younger daughter, B. Dobbin, just got her master's this summer in sustainable construction. And my older daughter, Niminongos, uh, she's, she's working on her master's in nursing right now. So we're very proud of them. And I don't like to brag uh, about you know what they do and stuff because I know there's a lot of uh, parents who struggle with the the children and you know it's I was always taught not to brag but I, I can't help but being a proud dad as well and my wife Tina Moses you know, she's a Anishinaabe Ojibwe as well she's from St. Ignace and uh, we we met in college over at Lake State uh, we were both taking Native American studies so uh, it's, Native American studies has meant a lot to us and as I interact with all the, the students that go through our, our courses, our programs, you know, I get to see them grow and develop and go out there and change the world. You know, and it's really, it's really cool to see that. Uh, my, my main research interests are education uh, from a Native American perspective, uh, what we call Native American studies at the uh, higher education. We call it Indian education at K-12 level oftentimes. 
but really it's education. And I uh, am particularly interested in our treaty rights and how those two intersect. And I'm also very interested in food, food relations or how we think of food. And that's what brought me to the point where we had the decolonizing diet project as a research project that some of you are familiar with. Um, you know, and all of these things uh, wouldn't be possible without the water. You know, water, water is life. You know, I don't know if you see the shirt I'm wearing, uh, that uh, we, we got four of these before we went out to Standing Rock. Uh, and it was important for us to go out there and stand in solidarity uh, with all of our relatives uh, against the big black snake that they were trying to push through out there. And I got, uh, I was privileged to go out there with my family and carry the, an Eagle staff uh, for the tribal education department's national assembly. Uh, when I went out there, we visited the two camp schools. Then I was also uh, uh, able to go back out for the veterans gathering there at Standing Rock, the largest self-deployment of veterans in the United States history. And that's very important, right? Because we are protectors and a lot of people, I, I reflect on the idea that a lot of people uh, don't like to see violence, uh, but you know, sometimes we have to stand between the people who are praying and the people who might be shooting them. And so that was our job, as I saw it, was to go out there and to be that layer of protection uh, for the people. So, yeah, the work I, I do now, you know, it's it's really, uh, I think it, it centers on our spirituality. You know, I teach courses about uh, tribal relations, Indian education. Um, right now I'm teaching, teaching a course called uh, Native American Cultures and the Dynamics of the Religious Experience. Try saying that in one breath. Um, but it really, all of these courses, they all come back to the same basic idea and that it's about relations and it's about origins. It's about loving each other and living in balance and harmony with nature. Uh, it's about loving our mother, the earth and being, uh, you know, in tune with that. And of course, without the water, uh, the lifeblood of mother earth, uh, none of us would be here today. And so, uh, you know, I think recentering uh, is very important to all of these things. Identity is, it permeates Native American studies. Our identity is based on our relationship with the world around us, uh, the circle. So I'm going to leave it at that because I, I know that there's a lot more we need to talk about this evening. Miigwech. Miigwech, Marty. Miigwech. Um, so I'm originally from Minnesota and I have relatives from both Montreal and Grand Portage uh, in Minnesota. And uh it's uh it's really makes me so happy to be with this bunch tonight. I, uh, like I said, uh, embarrassingly to the entire group at the start of things. Um, uh, it's uh, really such a treat to be with people that I count as friends and um, partners in such important work. Um, I've heard all of these folks uh, speak before and I'm just so uh, honored to be in this discussion. Uh, I think a lot of what folks said is so important. All the issues that you brought up um, are exactly the same things that I would think about. And my angle is really to come and support in terms of language. So a lot of times what I'm doing are, you know, I've been really proud to be part of Wabajajak Press and be the translator, sometimes able to uh, put the Anishinaabe one on the page. Uh, I can remember learning the language and working early in revitalization up on Sugar Island uh, with, with Marty and there's a lot of ways that I feel this group has um, a broad reach and has a big impact. And I feel in a time of uncertainty, a lot of hope for our water and for our lakes in this region because we have these people protecting 
when I was thinking as others were speaking about what brought them to this work, uh, for me, Gakna Denue Magana Kikno Magajik Gaya Bizinda Gajik Gawayak. So all my relatives are teachers. <laughs> and I, I think that's why I started becoming someone that wanted to focus on helping with that revitalization effort because when we go out and we want to be able to speak to the water, we want to reconnect our traditions. I was lucky to grow up in Minnesota in Minneapolis during some times that were um, good, good times to be active, not always happy times. I mean, I think the AIM era was a time that was difficult for a lot of us, but it was also a time where we were proud to be working to be more visible than people had been before. Um, um, today for me is, if I'm kind of just speaking from the heart, the thing that's really interesting is as my own father is turning 80 and I think about how did I begin in working for the water and for the land and for the other beings in this space, not just the humans, it was really him teaching me. Um, he was very instrumental in teaching me to listen to the trees, to the walleyes, to the mergansers, to all of the parts of the environment that we are so connected to. Um, and he was one who was always, always singing. So it, it wouldn't be me involved in something unless I at least made you guys try to sing a little bit. So I put in the chat a song that I had written that was um, a song when I had talked to my dad, someone asked for a song and it was to learn how we can connect to the water and the beings in the water. So it's a song for the fish. And it was really one that was inspired by him and by the way we need to connect to all the beings. So this is a song that talks about specific fish, but it talks about how we share the waters. Um, I know we all have just a little bit of time, so I will use my last few minutes to just sing it through once for you, because I think that's one thing I've always tried to do is just make sure that I serve as a role model using the language. I raised both my girls to use it um, and I hope that we are all together raising another generation um, to speak and use our Anishinaabe one around here. So the fish song, if you want to find it, it's online. I hope you all sing it later. Um, we all need to just sing a lot for the water and for the fish. Um, this is how it goes. <laughs> Mara o ki en zivi e jimash koz yet mara o ji en. So I'll leave it with that. Um, I really, really am honored to be with all of you guys tonight, and I appreciate you being here. So you you that song. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thank you, Meg. And thank you all for taking some time and sharing a deeper introduction with us. I think it's a really important part of panels like this. Um, so for tonight's panel, um, we have prepared a set of questions. We'll pose one at a time. And we'd like to invite the panelists to, to speak to them. Um, the panelists, please don't feel like you need to answer every single question. Just speak to the ones that, that you feel called to speak to. Um, for the audience, we have uh, the Q&A available. Please type your questions in as we go, um, and we'll work to incorporate them into the panel discussion. Um, we're going to do our best to address as much of the question content as we're able, um, but we, we might not be able to, to cover everything. So without further ado, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Um, can you share more about a priority water issue in your community or in your region? So I'll, I'll just jump in. The, uh, one of the big issues we're dealing with right now is the uh, Enbridge Line 5. A and B running through the Straits of Mackinac. You know, the, uh, it really 
is the crux of the matter. The way that people think about that is jobs and energy. In fact, if you ever look at Enbridge's thing, they say Ener uh, life takes energy. Life takes energy is their motto. And I, I did this other thing. I said Enbridge takes lives because that's what they're doing, right? They're, they're extractive. They're taking uh, oil out of Mother Earth. Um, they're pumping it across great stretches through Bad River, through Kuna Bay Territory, all over to Bay Mills and Sault Ste. Marie Territory, and then through the Straits of Mackinac. All along the way, uh, there's this oil seeping out into the ground, into the lakes and streams, potentially uh, into the Great Lakes. And so that's, it takes lives. And I think that's one of the biggest issues uh, is this competition uh, for people's hearts and minds and how they think about our responsibility as humans. And it's not to make a bunch of money. You know, it's to protect Mother Earth and to protect uh, those around us, to be responsible and, and pay our, uh, our dues, right? It's, we're the ones that we, you know, the plants provide energy for the animals who we are, the animals. And you know, what do humans do? Our job is to be responsible. And so we have to, we have to, we have to stand up and protect so I guess that's one I would throw in there right away is, you know, it's like Dapple. It's, uh, it just happens to be another route in another company. Anyone else? Yeah. One that I would add really quick is that, uh, I always think of the way we used to know the water. So we would have known Mishapishu, we would have known how to be in the space and be safe. But recently I was looking at research with a number of people and in this region, Lake Michigan takes more lives by drowning than any other lake. The Great Lakes still have a number of drownings every year and Native Americans die more than any other ethnicity by drowning in the Great Lakes, which to me just seems so terrible that we haven't learned to be with the water in a good way or have everyone feel they have the opportunity to learn how to be safe in the water. I think it has to do with our communities having access and feeling connected to the water. So I hope that you know, we can get those old stories back of the Mishapishu that teaches us to beware those riptides or the Nibonike or the you know, Shinemek, all of the stories that we had about the water. Um, so for me, that's been something that I feel is a priority that as we move forward in generations, we don't want to lose all of our older teachings and stories. Um, actually, uh, it was interesting in the recent book that Cecilia and, and friends had made at Wabajijak, we have one picture that does have the Mishapishu in the water and a little nagik playing and stuff. And I thought, you know, we have to teach these stories. We have to teach people how to love the water and respect it, not be afraid in a bad way, but actually have some, some real respect for the water. So I hope we can reduce the drownings in, in future generations as well. I could also speak within our own community, it's legacy mining. Legacy mining has really impeded in our region here, you know, because of the copper industry. So that's what we do as a tribe is that, you know, we have one area that's really being impeded right now, which is the Buffalo Reef. And that's actually the, the breeding area, you know, for our local fish population. So, you know, with that, it really impedes on the commercial fishing, you know, also recreational fishing in our area. And also part of the GLRI, which, you know, Jessica had spoken about, that's what we do here is we have a sandpoint restoration site that actually it's um, a brownfield site. So what the tribe had done is we had purchased the property from the state to where we actually had acquired grants um, to actually put in an eight to 10 inch um, cap. And so we actually turned that into like a meditation area and exercise trail. And also, you know, we've been planting these wonderful medicines out there. 
And so, you know, we try to heal the land the best that we can, you know, and we also have lived with it for so long that, you know, it actually became a part of our life. So when I was a little girl, I remember standing on that, that um, the stamp sand out there on, you know, out here in Cuna Bay. And my grandfather would be out there with my mother, you know, they would pull their boat up and then they would go out and they would check nets. And I'm standing there with my grandmother, you know, with, on the sand. And the thing is, we had just learned to live along with it, you know, and I always make jokes about how, you know, back in the day, we used to have bonfires out there and I would, you know, we'd have weenie roasts, you know, we just lived with it, you know, so now we're in that space to where we can actually come together as a tribe, as a people, you know, working with other partners to be able to, you know, do something about it. Because not only does it impede, you know, the communities, it also impedes the, the fish population. So I agree that, you know, some of these teachings need to be brought back, you know, about the water, about how we could be good stewards, you know, and have this reciprocal relationship, you know, with Mother Nature to where, you know, now we have to assist her in healing. So we must learn to do our part, you know, as a community to come together and to stand for, you know, the protection of our lands, of Mother Earth, you know, in a good way. And most of all, Nibi, our water. That's all I have to say for now. So that's Jessica. I guess um, just to kind of echo what um, everybody else was saying, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I had reflected on this question in advance and you know what um, Kathy and um, Marty brought up, those are the same things that I immediately came to mind as the top issues, priority water issues. Um, you know, both in my local tribal community and in the region, I see um, the protection of water from, um, or the biggest priority water issue is the protection of water from irreversible impacts that could occur um, that are posed by the extractive industries. Um, this was also um, part of a lot of what my master's research um, looked at was indigenous rights and um, extractive industries. Um, so both the mineral extraction where we have the legacy impacts um, that are especially um, evident in the um, Keweenaw Peninsula with one of the most toxic hotspots, the, um, one of the worst areas of concern in the Great Lakes. Um, and then also with um, the oil industry and the tar sands that are having a massive impact on First Nations communities in Canada. Um, and then that um, those negative impacts are also posing a risk to the Great Lakes. Um, and as um, Marty mentioned with the Straits of Mackinac Line 5, there's the two twin um, aging pipelines that are um, transporting that um, heavy tar sands oil. And, um, you know, there's, the, this nation has had a lot of um, experience with um, oil catastrophes, um, like in the Gulf and in the oceans. Um, there's also the Kalamazoo one in Michigan as well, um, not too far in our recent past. Um, but there's modeling online that shows, you know, how far it could spread if there was um, a, a fracture or a, a incident with the straits there. Um, and this is heavy oil. It's not going to be as easy to um, clean off of the surface. And so that's, I see that as a big issue. Um, and I think, you know, with all of the tailings basins that already exist in the basin as well, um, particularly in northern Minnesota and the upper peninsula of Michigan, um, I'm also concerned with the effects of climate change and increasing um, rain events in the region. And a lot of these um, basins have been designed, um, not taking into account um, these massive rain events. Um, so I just, um, that's a big concern that I see as these kind of larger, bigger risks that are um, increasing, increasingly putting pressure on our Great Lakes and our water. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and move to the second question. 
Can you share with us how you envision social justice? So you, can, oh, go ahead, thank you. I'll go ahead and share. Um, so how I envision, envision social justice is basically through a lot of the work that we do across Anishinaabe Aki um, by focusing on racial justice that's native led and doing that work in our rural and remote communities. Um, you know, because one of the things I do as the director of the NJC is I spend a lot of time looking at grants and researching that. And we have one of the greatest uh, funding disparities. It's 0.3% of 1% of philanthropy goes to native led groups. The other part of that very small percent goes to non-native groups working on our issues. So it is critical that this work remains by and for our people and communities. And then if you are in Michigan, and I've had, you know, I lived in different parts of our territory in Michigan, growing up in metropolitan Detroit and seeing, you know, where, where grants, where um, foundations exist and where they decide funding goes. And I can tell you what, many of those foundations don't decide that the funding goes to native communities. It doesn't go north of Clare. And there's a clear line. Many of you know this who grew up maybe in the big city like Detroit or Grand Rapids or Kalamazoo, that once you get north at a certain point, it's different. So, I envision the work that we do as native-led social and racial justice, that it has to be led by and for people and communities. That in order to have true self-determination, true sovereignty, true nationhood building, this is what we need. And so what I've seen is and had these conversations with funders, and I say, this is critical. It cannot be, we're not gonna heal generational trauma with a $5,000 grant, <laughs> all right? So we have to be clear and bold in this work, and we are. And so um, the model that we have by primarily focusing on racial justice, because racial justice can cover so many things, water issues, um, treaty rights, you know, the, the, all the ways we are in, in deal with racism on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's in the grocery store, the stereotypes, you know, dealing with racism in the workplace. So it's critical, there's that component as well as the component I'm working on, even the marginal issues within our communities like two-spirit identity, creating those safe and supportive spaces, harm reduction, and moving in a way from uh, lateral violence to lateral kindness. So working on these issues and kind of building that within the community and being clear, you know, it's great to have that, those intersectional movements, but at the same time, Native people, we need our own spaces and our own movements to be able to determine, you know, what we would like to see in Anishinaabe Aki and what we'd like to see for our nation. I, I got uh, some, a little bit to add. You know, uh, you guys see that uh, image on the wall behind Jessica, that uh, it's one of my favorite images in the whole world. And it's from an 1849 treaty petition from the Anishinaabe to the Wash or yeah to the president in Washington D.C. and it carried on a birch piece of birch bark and showing those lines that go from that that crane clan being that image there to the other beings to their from the crane's eyes to their eyes and from the crane's hearts to their hearts but it also connects that crane being to the water. And that's such a powerful image, right? Because it reminds us that we are responsible not only for the relationships with other humans, but we model our behaviors after these animals, these animal nations, plant nations, and Mother Earth is our primary teacher, Akinomage. You know, there's a reason why when we translate, you know, uh, Meg, when we translate education uh, from English to Anishinaabem or, or vice versa, you know, the earth will show us the way, our primary teacher, right? And so that, to me, that's 
a shared vision for social justice is a, a vision that we have to share with everybody. Uh, we have to get back in balance and harmony and we have to uh, really be mother earth focused uh, and to share that vision with others. That's all I'm gonna say. I would add just one little piece to that. I think that one of the things I was thinking as everyone was talking was the, the word gonna wind them all or gonna wind on is to care for, to be a part of a system that you feel responsible for and to be a steward. And so I think social justice is something that allows us all to be a part of a network. So we feel supported, but we also feel that we have a responsibility to support the life around us too. So it means taking care of that water, taking care of the land, all of that. So yeah, it's a good, good way to think about it. Yeah, and I guess I would just add, when I think about social justice and the context of Native Americans, um, Native peoples, um, I think about acknowledgement, um, respect, repairing relationships, um, um, especially people and the land, um, but also um, intergenerational healing is a big thing um, for our peoples. Um, there's an initiative right now um, that's put forth by um, Representative Deb Holland and Senator um, Elizabeth Warren for um, truth and reconciliation for the boarding school era um, and the effect of boarding schools that and what that had on uh, Native peoples across this country. Um, you know, where, you know, where the, it's, it, the, the justice that you know, Native Americans have um, or need are kind of striving for in this country. It's it's very complex, and it's you know it's you know healing even you know within our communities, within our families. Um, so it's kind of I never really thought of it as kind of like so as social justice. It's more just this broader justice from all of the genocide that has happened. Um, so, and I think it starts with acknowledging and the truth of that um, and then repairing. Um, and there is a lot of good work that, that is happening and a lot of revitalization, but um, I think there's still a lot more, um, a lot more to be done. Um, I remember growing up in school, um, the, there was one day in my history class in high school that we um, talked about the boarding schools, um, but that was it until I, learned on my own and through college. So I think um, like the work that Marty's doing in the education is really, really the key part of this for the justice. Yeah, I agree. Marty, did you want to add to that? Just one more thing. You know, uh, Jessica talked about the idea of reconciliation, truth and reconciliation. And I think we have to be careful because like Tiage Alfred, uh, has suggested, you know, for uh, First Nations in Canada, you know, if we don't require them to right the wrongs, if we only allow them to feel good about saying, oh, yeah, what a bad thing we did. And then we all, now we just get along, right? We, we do the land acknowledgement and everything's good. But we really have to right the wrongs. It has to be deep and sincere and it has to be addressing the brutalization of our, our peoples and the earth. Because as, uh, as he suggests, reconciliation can very easily become recolonization. You know, it's just colonization all over again. They, now they get to take on our identity and we don't, we don't want that. You know, we want to be respected in our own identities. So I, uh, I really appreciate the idea of reconciliation but only if it's sincere and not just some kind of makeup. Yeah, I think that repair, you know, it is, is really crucial to, to being a part of that process. Um, and it will be a, a long process. I really appreciate all of um, the things that you're sharing. So now we can, um, there are 
a handful of really great questions and um, some are about the water walk, but I really want to follow up with this question that uh, really reflects the, the parts of your conversation right now. And so somebody asked, what role does language, does reclaiming Anishinaabe Moan in particular play in both understanding and healing our relationship to the land and to each other? to social justice. I might be the biggest language geek here, or this is the one that spends all my time teaching um, and translating. Um, so I'll just throw in a few things and I'm sure others have ideas too. But I think that for us, um, one story I know I've told often, I've tried to remind people that we just have a different way of thinking when we're using Anishinaabe one. And a really good example is we often learn how to say to one another gazagin, or it's also really important to know to say nizagadis. So gazagin is I love you. Nizagadis is I love myself. And I hope all our youth grow up knowing to love themselves. And I think when you have that kind of love for yourself and for others, then it allows you to connect to the world and take care of it. And a lake is zagaigan. So that zage, that idea of zak as uh, zagajagabo, zak, zagamuk, like all these words that have zak in, it means there's an opening. So when we think of the very most important thing in our world that centers who we are in Nishnabaya King, we think of the lakes. So that big opening on the earth where the water is open to us and connects with the land, that connects with our concept of, of love. So if you just say love in English, it doesn't make you think of a lake. It doesn't make you think of an opening. It doesn't make you think of the way that you form relationships by being open. So there's just, there's so many other lessons in our language that if we lose our language, we lose all those lessons. So I think that's one of the reasons I've tried to invest time in helping people remember and know those lessons. I know others here though will jump in and, and add to that because these are some language warrior friends I, I have in this chat room with me. <laughs> so. So Meg, does that mean Zagad this Mazinagan would be a good translation for my resume or my bio? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I love myself. Here's why. No, I'm just kidding. The uh, thing I wanted to add, uh, again, going back to that image, the, uh, the image there behind Jessica and uh, reflecting on treaties. You know, when we are uh trying to stand up for our treaty rights today our treaty rights are one of those things that is recognized as the supreme law of the land in the united states and so you know uh, they're not perfect documents those treaties are very imperfect but they are a piece of law that we can draw on as native people as tribe tribal nations first nations uh in protection of mother earth and our uh, fellow spiritual beings here. That meaning, the meaning from treaties has to be resolved in favor of Indians. It has to come from Indian understanding at the time the treaties were written. Guess what folks? The only way we're gonna find that meaning is through our language. And I, I love, there's one example in the, uh, the treaties where they, uh, the treaty negotiations where the United States person uh, hands a neck medal. They used to symbolize the passing or acceptance of a treaty in neck medals. They would give them neck medals or necklaces like medallions. And once they put these on, that symbolized that this treaty is now in force. So in Anishinaabemowin, which is really cool, before that neck medal was put around someone's neck, it has an inanimate. It's inanimate. But once they put that neck metal on their, their selves, then they, uh, it becomes animated. So it becomes a living piece of metal. It's imbued with life. And so that's really important to our understanding of how we can use treaties to protect our, our mother earth today and each other and how language fits into that idea. 
our language is very important, you know, with us reconnecting back to our land, back to our culture. You know, as a, through my teachings, the way it's taught to me is that even if we don't know the language, even if we just sit and observe, you know, the songs in our language, we will actually start picking it up. I got to the point to, you know, since attending Lodge or even listening to Howard Gimawan, who is the language teacher here, he comes and shares a lot with us, you know, even reaching out. And then he's also teaching a lot of the medicines. And he's always speaking about how we must speak from the heart, you know, because like even with our our grand chief, he was also talking about other people who have also held on to their language, you know, even the Japanese people, how they still have their culture and their traditions. Whereas in the Shinabe, you know, some of us no longer have it, especially in our own community. You know, when I was living here, you know, back in the day, it was, there was a big disconnect, you know, so, but, you know, reconnecting back, you know, with Lodge and reconnecting back to our, our songs, our Medewan songs and our, our language, you know, oh my gosh, when you start speaking this language, it's from the heart and you can feel it. Even when people have that passion of just learning, you know, they, there's no right way or wrong way. Even when they teach us our songs, we just hum it to the best way we can, you know. So, you know, we are trying to revitalize our language within our own lodge to where we're doing introductions, you know, here within our own community with um, our local college. I'm also a board member for the Kuna Bay Ojibwe Community College to where, you know, it's becoming more vital to, you know, revitalize our language within our own community. So that's where I bring in the cultural teachings and trying to, you know, revitalize that within our own youth. And I think that's really important, you know, to get that out there and to teach our youth, you know, the importance of our songs and importance of our language to keep them connected to our culture. Me, you. Thank you, um, all of you. Um, I am realizing as I'm listening to all of you and then I just noticed the time. Um, and I feel like we're just starting to have a conversation. Um, but we have 15 minutes remaining as uh, it doesn't even feel like it, it feels really short actually. Um, and we have, many of the, the questions uh, that we're just not going to be able to get to. Um, but there is one question that we actually wanted each of you to address. Uh, we're talking about a lot of heavy issues and um, just heavy responsibilities, I think, that are, that are on all of us. Um, but I do recognize also that this is about celebrating indigenous land, waters, and life. And so I would like to hear from each of you, all of us uh, would like to hear from each of you about why is it important to celebrate indigenous lands, water, and lives? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> it's very important that we, um, you know, come together and celebrate, you know, the gifts that um, Mother Earth has given us. You know, because if we don't acknowledge her in a good way, you know, look what's happened, you know, when it's put in our trust. And here we are, you know, being good stewards and we must step up and to help protect what we have. You know, there was a prediction, you know, from our grand chief that, you know, the weight of man water is going to be, you know, just as much as, as gold, you know, so if we do not, you know, support our, our good stewards and, you know, to teach the youth, I, I keep reiterating that, you know, to celebrate Nibi because, you know, that's, that's our life. That's our lifeline. Um, you know, with the people of the heart water walk, you know, talk about social justice, you know, that's what we're doing here as communities. When these Quay had reached out to us for some of these teachings, you know, I couldn't say no. 
I had to step up, you know, and, and help my sister Terry, you know, to, to bring these teachings to, to the Jagannaths, to the others, because we were asked of that. You know, we had a Father's Day flood here a few years ago to where, you know, water, water is life. Water has that spirit. And if we don't treat water in a good way, it will respond back. But, you know, it's very important for us to celebrate me be, you know, Gichi Gumi out here in a good way, you know, because that's what actually sustains us as Ojibwe people, as people in all cultures that come together, you know, so it's, we must celebrate her and start being, you know, acknowledging each other with much love, much kindness, and much compassion in a good way to where we must do this work together, you know, because like with our community, like I had said before, with a lot of our restoration projects, our you know, wild rice restoration, without our partners, we would not be at the time and space that we are right now. And so we actually do have a tribal water day here within our own community, which was, you know, we've invited a lot of our partners because without them standing by our side, you know, there is no way that we could do this work on our own. So it's important that we must have the Jagannash come and join us, you know, and and to learn and we must learn from each other because you know we're not the only ones that um hunt and gathered you know these medicines you know we all did at one point in time and space so it's important that we must stand together and celebrate and you be in a good way and for you know panelists and you know attendees here to join us you know within this water walk even from a virtual aspect to pray for and you be in a good way which I believe there are two things that we need to do. There's two things that are absolute. We got to rise up and protect the earth. We got to put future generations first. Ceremony, I think, is very important. So, you know, we celebrate, uh, ceremony and celebration seem synonymous to me. And ceremonies give us an opportunity to bring back the balance. That's exactly what they're intended for, to rebalance ourselves in relation to the world around us. Ceremonies are also important because it requires us to commit to something in front of others. You know, when we verbalize that we will be part of this very important prayer, that we will commit to this idea of protecting our Mother Earth. We're not just saying it in our heads between us and the creator. We're saying it in front of everybody. And I think those are the, um, what I'll uh, end with tonight. Miigwech. Miigwech. I guess I can go next. Um, so to me, it's really about um, honoring and respecting the gifts that we are given. Um, and it's really, um, you know, a responsibility. And I think back, you know, um, again, to the, to the pictograph behind me, um, how our ancestors had the foresight to think ahead to our generations and future generations. Um, you know, and we have that same responsibility to um, to take care of the land and water and um, the fish and wildlife and native plants, um, all of these things that um, if we take care of it, they will sustain us. And um, in order to live a good life, Minobama is a win. And for future generations to have Minobama is a win, um, we need to take care of those and respect um, and be, you know, exercise or have gratitude for, um, you know, the beautiful fresh water that we have and not take it for granted. Um, so that kind of also just makes me think of the, back to the water issues in the region. And I just, um, it is um, global in scale. And so I feel like there's even more responsibility um, and especially as an Anishinaabe Kwe and it's the, um, the women who, um, carry that responsibility um, to protect the water and life. And um, so I think just that solidarity of um, in our region and the, 
the protection um, and stepping up to that responsibility, um, native and non-native alike, you know, it's significant um, for the entire world for protecting our fresh water. Beautiful. Miigwech. Cecilia or Mac? Sure. I can go next. Um, I've lived out of the territory for grad school and I don't like to travel out of the territory very much. And when I do, I try to come back as quick as possible. Like when I have a presentation, say I've had, had one in Kentucky or Ohio, I like to get back to the Great Lakes Basin as soon as possible. Um, I love the water and what, as Anishinaabe, this is who we are. So it's our homeland. And we have a responsibility to the water here. Everything from like the marsh to the little stream to the ways the land is going to change in these times. Um, and I live here in Manistee and I'm in Itagon. Um, I've been down to the shoreline and there's definitely changes from um, climate change. So you can see it. And one of the state parks that I like to run at, they are having to move to the pavilion that's on the bluff due to erosion. So it is real, it's happening. And um, just to consider that. So the effects on our water and what the land is going to do and what the water is going to do. Um, and I think we know that as Anishinaabe, we've had these changes and endured these changes. Um, and there's going to be changes that we have to, um, you know, I think that's where our our prophecies come into place, the knowledge and the wisdom in our communities and what we're gonna do moving ahead. Um, also, why is it important to celebrate indigenous lands, waters and lives? It's important because indigenous representation matters. Um, it's really important to celebrate all the achievements because so much of the time we deal with the stereotypes, discrimination, racism. And I think about my own family's journey um, with my grandfather having to move from Keweenaw Bay to Detroit, and he was fluent in Anishinaabe Moen. And so the journey to come around here and have a small press and be, you know, revitalizing the language is awesome. So thinking about the process, um, enduring forced poverty, this hasn't been imposed on us, that colonial poverty and the ways we had a be that beautiful traditional economies prior to colonization. Um, and why representation matters is because of we endure consistent erasure um, in the majority culture and just in general being out and about. Um, so we have to celebrate all the achievements. There, we're business owners, we're leaders, we're athletes, we're lawyers, we're physicists. So that is so critical um, on Indigenous People's Day just to celebrate everything uh, that we've endured and who we are today. Very nice, Miigwech. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if you want me to add in a little bit there. I think that we all agree on the issues and why it's so important to do this. And I do think that, you know, a couple of us brought it up to the concept of Mino Bemadase. And I think that's another thing where we learn to say Mino Bemadase when, and we know that that means to kind of live a good life, but thinking about that Bime in there, the Bemadase, the way that we're moving forward and to be sure that, you know, that we're living in a good way and we're moving forward in a good way because really when we think about time and space and our little planet and the connection to the sun and the water that brings all of this to life, we really are all connected and this is our little space and we need to really make sure that we're good stewards of it. So to keep in mind the way we connect to this place really holds all of that together, I think. So I think that would be my answer to that. I cannot believe how quickly this time went by. It's just been such an honor to, to see everybody tonight. I, I agree. Um, I can't believe how, how quickly the time passed and it makes me think about how we need to do this more often. Um, I am always so, so grateful and impressed about how much I, I learned, new things that I've learned here um, from each of you. Um, 
And even thinking about Cecilia, you bringing up the funding disparities, and I've known that to be an issue, but you having that, that uh, research data, I think it is critical. And, um, and I can't believe Meg saying to, I want to say me, but she's saying to all of us and, and, and Jessica, it's been much too long since <clears throat> since we've had a conversation and I got to hear some of these thoughts instead of you just uh, running meetings. And so it's just been such an honor. And um, Kathy, you always have these, uh, these lessons that you share that um, I just really take to heart. And sometimes when you speak, I feel like you're, you're just talking to me. Um, and, and our partnership. And it's just so, so meaningful because I know how much you mean it uh, about working with all the different partners uh, for our community. I, I just know you mean it. And it's uh, just really uh, meaningful to me. And, and Marty, we're going to be on um, a journey together, you know, in, in our work of food sovereignty. And I'm just so, so excited um to finally connect the work that we do um and and i i'm just so thankful that we all got to spend this time together and i know we have a large audience this is probably the largest webinar uh, well it is the largest webinar i ever ever hosted um and and it really is because of all of you our panelists here today um and you each brought different people uh, to this group uh, this evening and shared it with us. Um, so as much as I don't want to close, I'm I'm gonna Emily and and Angela and I are gonna talk about like hmm how can we do this again um, sooner than later, uh, not having to wait for a specific day, right? Let let's let's get together and have these conversations. They're so important. I do want to make two important announcements uh, in, in celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day this year. There are other events that are taking place in our community. Um, and so Meg will be uh, a part of Love in the Time of COVID-19, a poetry reading. She's going to read some of her poetry uh, from her new collection in What the Chickadee Knows. Uh, it, that will be Monday evening. And everyone who registered will get an email with these announcements. So don't worry, you won't miss any links or, or dates or times. We'll, we'll get all this to you. Um, and the other event, we have some questions about the water walk. Uh, we, because of, and I had this up, let me share my screen really quickly and show you, oh, of course. Oh, that was, I was trying to get that song, Meg. You'll, you'll need to, to share that with us. Um, let me, it was an update about the, did I lose it? No, it's right here. So the people of the heart, uh, water walk, uh, the our water walkers are encouraging everyone uh, to participate uh, in your own communities, around the water bodies, around your homes and the areas that you like to go to. Uh, there will be a core group of water walkers, um, but if you are not a core walker, uh, take a friend, take a family member and go to some of the water uh, bodies in and around your own home. We'll put this link also in the announcement so you will all get it. Um, and everyone can share their stories, photos, places that you visited. And also, um, if you do not have Facebook, there's another way to share those as well. Um, and that it, it's just such a beautiful way. And, and think about all the uh, different bodies of water Nabi, that are all around us and all the places that all of our community members are, are going to go and celebrate and sing and prayers and offer Sema um, and thinking about all the wonderful gifts that Nabi shares with us every day. And I believe, Emily, you are going to close us out. 
Yeah, thanks, Val. Um, I just wanted to say chi miigwech to everyone for attending, especially to our panelists. I feel quite comfortable speaking for everyone here um, to say that we're immensely grateful for you, that you spent your evening with us and that you shared so much of yourself and your stories with us. It's, it's really been an honor to hear. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Amiguitch, it's an honor to be here. Amiguitch, bama pi! Bama pi! Bama pi! Bama pi! Amiguitch!